In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tomorrow, on July 4th, Americans throughout our nation will celebrate the holiday known as Independence Day. And for those of you who may be history buffs, it is interesting to note the following. The Declaration of Independence was not actually signed on July 4th, 1776, by all of the colonies. In fact, what had happened was, on July 1st, 1776, the Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia, and it was the person of John Adams who was pushing for independence. On July 2nd, the motion was passed for independence with no dissenting vote. And here's what John Adams wrote to his wife the next day. He said, the second day of July 1776 will be the most memorable, memorable day in the history of America. But as we know, it was not to be so because the delegates spent the next two days, July 3rd and 4th, debating and also revising the language of the statement that was drafted by Thomas Jefferson. Thus, on July 4th, Congress officially adopted the Declaration of Independence and as a result of this, we celebrate Independence Day on July 4th. However, it was nearly a month after that that the actual signing of the Declaration took place by all of the colonies. Now, as we look back, we are a little over than 200 some years old. And when we think about it and we look around the world today, whether we listen to the radio or whether we listen, see what's on TV, we are very fortunate and very blessed to live here in the United States and to be thankful and grateful for all of the freedoms and opportunities that we hold so dear. However, one thing that many of us unfortunately forget is we don't give honor and praise to the person who is the author of all of this, the person who looks into our hearts and the person who guides and strengthens us, and that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, when we go into Holy Scripture, especially into the Old Testament, we look at Psalm 32, and Psalm 32 is extremely important because it is God speaking to his chosen people, Israel, and it is really a hymn of praise. Let me just read and listen to how often you hear the words rejoice, praise, and give thanks. This is the beginning of Psalm 32. Rejoice greatly in the Lord, O righteous ones. Praise is fitting for the upright. Give thanks to the Lord on the lyre. Sing praises to him on a ten-string instrument. Sing to him a new song. Sing praises beautifully with a shell, for the word of the Lord is right. Now, what these people are saying, and the author of this is David. David the king is the author, and it is a hymn of praise, but it also probably resulted from a national victory that the people had. But what he is saying here is we need to acknowledge who's in charge of our nation and our people, and that is indeed God himself. The psalmist states that God sees all people, and what he knows is what's in their hearts. And then we get one of the most probably um, reiterated verses that we'll hear, especially on Memorial Day. In verse 12, we hear the following. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. In other words, we will be blessed if we acknowledge God in our lives in our laws, in our rules, and in our everyday lives. And the psalmist states here that God looks down from his dwelling place and sees and knows what's in each and every one of our thoughts as well as our hearts. God never uh, saves the self-confident. Those who think that, oh, it's because of me or us that we are so great, he frowns upon and he doesn't look to any ruler or king for human strength, nor can we expect them to deliver us. 
For example, when we look at verses 13 to 17, it states the following. The Lord looked attentively from heaven. He saw all the sons of men. From his prepared dwelling place, he looked upon all who dwell on earth. He who alone fashioned their hearts. God knows each and every one of us by name. He who... Uh, understands all their works. A king is not saved by his large army, and a giant shall not be saved by the immense strength. A horse is a false hope for salvation, and it shall not be saved by its enormous power. What this says is it doesn't mean that we don't, don't have a defense, we don't have a military, but unless we acknowledge God as in control and leading us, we will indeed have problems. But then the psalmist clearly states, David does show who is in charge and who does save. And what we like to read here is verse 18. He says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. Now, the word fear here means to be in awe. It is like God is so glorious. God is so victorious. God is all holy, all powerful, all knowing, omnipresent, omniscient omnipotent, etc., that we have to rely on him alone. Then the psalm concludes with three main points. It includes what believers in God can and should do to demonstrate our faith and our trust in the Lord. The first one we are to do is wait in the hope of the Lord. Why? Because he alone is our helper and our protector. And how hard is this for us to do? For example, when you looked this, uh, a couple of weeks ago at the disaster in Orlando, you looked at this past week and we look at what took place in Turkey and Bangladesh. What is the initial reaction? It's almost like we would say, where is God's justice? Where is something going to be done? Who is going to take over, etc.? No different than what the people of Israel were expecting from their Messiah. And sometimes it's hard in our own lives to wait on the Lord and see how he's working in our own individual lives. We want an answer now. We pray and say, God, I want this. Give me this. You know what I need. And when we don't get it, then the test of faith becomes. Are we going to trust in God or are we not? Are we going to put our faith in him or in the faith in someone or something else? And so the first thing we are to do is it says in verse 20 here, our soul shall wait for the Lord. He is our helper and our protector. Now, the second thing we are to do, in addition to waiting on the Lord, is to rejoice in the Lord whom we trust. And what we uh, hear in verse 21 is the following. For our heart shall be glad in him and rejoice in him, and we hope in his holy name. The late theologian, Father Alexander Schmemann, said, we should never see a joyless Christian. There should never be somebody who calls himself or herself a Christian who is not joyful. Because regardless how bad things get, we still trust in God and know that he will deliver us or give us what each of us needs for our salvation. And therefore, what we realize is that we should always be a witnessing joyful Christian. Now, why should we be joyful? simply because we know what uh, is the end result and who we trust in. In the hymn to Pascha, we sing, the angels cried to the lady full of grace, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice, for your son has risen from the de dead. Christ has overcome death. Christ has overcome sickness. Christ will be in his kingdom. We know the end story. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen. And then we realize is that at the end, those who trust and believe in him and put their faith into action through love will be with Christ. And thirdly, we are to pray. Pray for our unfailing love from our Lord and Savior, but our responsibility is to pray that God's will be done in our lives. When God chose his chosen people, Israel, and when they obeyed and thanked him, things went well. But as soon as they did not, and as soon as he let them get their own way, things went very south quickly. Now, today as a church, we are what you would call the new Israel. 
The people who have put their faith in Christ are called the new Israel, and now we are held accountable for trusting and loving our Lord and Savior. We know that our nation was found on the Judeo-Christian principles and values, but the question we must ask ourselves today is, are we actually continuing those values? Now, also, we may ask ourselves, how do we compare to perhaps the Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire when they fell? And to answer this question, it's very interesting to note an individual by the name of Alexander Tyler, a Scottish historian who uh, taught at, uh, <clears throat> in Scotland at the University in Edinburgh. This was in 1877. And what he said was the following. He looked at the Republic of the Athenians, the Athenian Republic, which some 2,000 years had existed prior to him. And here's what, he, again, Alexander Tyler says. He says, a democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury with the result that every democracy will finally collapse over loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. But what's more important, listen to the phases he talks about a, a, an empire. It starts out from bondage under somebody else and then goes to spiritual faith. Notice what he says first. The people, and think of our forefathers who came here to the United States initially, a lot of them left England, other places, because of persecution, whether taxes and also not to be told to worship in one way. So you start out with spiritual faith. The next phase goes from spiritual faith to great courage, then from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and from dependence back to bondage. When you look at the Byzantine Empire and the Roman Empire, there are many causes for the fall, but what uh, Professor Tyler here states is true. And one of the ways in which they fell was a lack of moral, spiritual guidance. Now today, I would have to ask you, are we in the area of spiritual faith, great courage, liberty, abundance, complacency, apathy, dependence, and bond, or back in bondage? Maybe we've gotten through the first four, spiritual faith, great courage, liberty, and abundance, but I pray we're not at complacency or apathy. But when you look at the laws being passed and the situation with homosexuals being permitted to marry in churches, with abortion taking place, and we can go on and on and on. We are either going to be with God or not. God loves everyone, don't get me wrong, and we want repentance from everyone, but we cannot condone what's politically correct. And our nation, it seems, according to Tyler, going down that just like we see in Europe and other places. So we look at this, and sometimes we get concerned. But then in the end, what do we know? God's still in charge. God will deliver us, but it's up to each and every one of us to repent. Psalm 32 clearly and emphatically states, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We will be blessed as long as we put God first in our lives, in our laws, etc. as long as we rejoice in him, thank him, and remain obedient to him. Everyone knows the saying, we don't appreciate something until we've lost it or it is taken away from us. May our personal and our nation's relationship with God never become one of complacency or apathy. Rather, may we, <clears throat> as followers, listen to the words of the psalmist, and may our hearts be glad in him, may our souls wait on the Lord, for he truly alone is our helper and our protector. Amen.